I'm gonna be honest, the first time I saw that the title of this episode was named Splitsville, I totally thought it was going to be some sort of romantic comedy episode featuring one of the girls having a boyfriend that breaks up with them. And knowing the reboot, I wouldn't have been surprised had that been the case. Thankfully, the episode instead revolves around some inner team conflict amongst the girls and how each of them doesn't really understand or appreciate their sister's methods when it comes to solving problems and fighting monster battles. We all know it by this point, Blossom is the more methodical one who sticks to logic and plans, Bubbles is the cutesy one who loves animals and artwork, and Buttercup is just a big Jerko Minerko. Jerko Minerko? I'm not a good name caller, okay? Nah, in reality all three of the girls can be jerks at points, Buttercup is really the tomboy who's all about brute force. This is a dynamic that hasn't necessarily been acknowledged in the show yet outside of a few small conflicts. Obviously, yes, it's true that Blossom has gone overboard with her plans in the past and her sisters weren't very receptive of it, as seen in Puff Dora's box, and yeah, Buttercup is prone to being a bigger jerk than she already is at points, so when I say that this dynamic hasn't been seen in the show, much yet, I say it in the sense that while yes, the girls all have their own differing personalities and interests that have led them into conflict before, there hasn't been an episode that focuses on all three of them headbutting with each other at once. Every time there's an episode featuring inner team conflict, it's just one of the girls against the other two. So to actually see all three of them hold a different point of view as the main focus of the episode is something we haven't seen before. Not to mention this shows how the girls' conflicting methods have gotten in the way of fighting crime, which is also a less than common premise to see in the show overall. Now obviously part of this reason is because of how sparse the crime fighting in the show is to begin with, but even despite that, there's a part of me that believes this was almost guaranteed to be an episode eventually. Without jumping the gun, I definitely say that the episode has its pros and cons, and keep in mind that the reboot has set the bar really low when it comes to quality episodes. At the very least, Splitsville pits the girls up against unfamiliar and new challenges that they're not used to solving because their sisters would be the ones doing the job for them, but we'll get into what all that means as the review goes on. So, without further ado, let's roll. So we're not even five seconds in and there's already a sort of continuity issue. All right, so this episode starts with the girls fighting the same French lobster looking monster we've seen before as they fly around rapidly beating it into a pulp in the local neighborhood. Now at first glance, it just seems like a regular monster battle where the girls are just beating it up to save the day, no big deal, but then things don't seem to be adding up. Let's look back to the episode Halt and Catch Silico for a second, where we've coincidentally enough seen the girls facing off against the exact same monster in a neighborhood somewhere in Townsville. Now, for those who may not recall, in that episode specifically, the girls had been battling the same creature and ended up knocking him down onto a nearby house, thus destroying all of the tiny robotic buddies Silico had been keeping in there and sending him down the path of evil. At the end of that episode, the girls vowed that they would be more careful when it came to their heroic acts of justice. Now, the way I see it, there's two possibilities to take from this situation here. Either the battle in this episode is that very event and this episode just happens to take place several years in the past, which doesn't really make sense in terms of the aging continuity in the show regarding the girls considering the existence of Bliss, but that's a whole other can of worms that will be addressed another time. The second, and more likely option, is that this episode just neglects the whole instance in Halt and Catch Silico entirely, and the girls beat up the exact same monster in a similar neighborhood while doing damage to other homes in the process without being more careful whatsoever. In which case, I acknowledge that continuity isn't exactly the biggest priority of the reboot, and I'm not too terribly strict when it comes to this, but if it's a direct contradiction like this, then it's at least going to send me some mixed signals. I don't really buy the first theory at all, considering the show is A, not smart enough to do that, and B, not giving any indication of it at all, so I'm going to assume this is just a lack of care or attention towards what was established in the first season. Anywho, the girls finally arrive at home after a hard day of battling, which we didn't get to see unfortunately, and begin to argue with each other as to whose fault it was for the fight taking as long as it did. 
It's subtly mentioned in passing that the girls ended up missing their classmates kickball game because they got called in to save the day and the battle took longer than any of them were hoping for. It's also implied, based on the way the three of them are fighting, that all of them wanted to just hurry up and rush through the fight so they would make it on time, but all three got in each other's way, making the brawl take way longer than it needed to, hence why they're all yelling at each other in this scene. Think three girls and a monster, only the difference is that the arguing takes place after the battle rather than during it, and that all three of the girls are engaging in the conflict rather than Bubbles staying on the sidelines. It ultimately results in pointing fingers and blaming each other for the delay, but since we never got to see this conflict take place, there's no real way to tell who is truly at fault here. Although, based on what the girls say about each other, it is kinda easy to figure out who isn't to blame. We would've kicked that monster's tail in two minutes flat. Which is why this is all your fault! It is not my fault! Bubbles is right. It was Buttercup's fault. Or should I say, Miss Punchalot? Yeah, the argument sort of falls apart at the end there, considering Buttercup was doing exactly what she should have done. I totally get why Blossom would be a target here, considering she tends to go overboard with her plans, and that absolutely frustrates her sisters because they essentially get bossed around and told what to do. And Bubbles could also take some blame if that dancing story is true, because then she becomes a hypocrite for being angry that they didn't defeat the monster fast enough when she's a part of the reason it took so long. I can't really blame Buttercup cup for being at fault here in any capacity based on what we've been told, considering that she was the only one that was really trying to take the monster down as quick and efficiently as possible. And like, if the cartoon could have quickly emphasized that Buttercup was, say, being so reckless that she was destroying houses for no reason, then that would be enough for me. I get why Blossom would be angry with Buttercup for not following her plan, but since the argument here revolves around how long the battle took and that we don't know whether or not Buttercup did anything wrong during it, I'm siding with her on this one. She's the only one here who actually tried to just get the fight over with instead of overcomplicating things, or in Bubbles' case, not trying at all. And the fact that her sisters go after her don't make them look any better, considering both of them were blatantly making the fight take longer than it should have. But, for the sake of the episode, they still need to attack her because it's necessary to complete the triangle of blame and make each of the girls look like they're at fault. Honestly, I just think that Buttercup's flaw in that monster battle needed to be elaborated on a little more besides just being called a name. Amidst the girls' incessant arguing, the mayor interrupts them by phoning them individually, as opposed to just calling one phone and telling them everything at once, for some reason, with three new tasks that all need to be completed. What's up, Mayor? Emergency downtown! What's up, Mayor? Another one? On our way. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ooh, I'd love to cut my wireless bill in half. Each one of these tasks are purposefully set up by the narrative to test all three girls' ability to solve a problem using one of their sister's usual methods as a way of showing them some appreciation of a different point of view when it comes to fighting crime and solving civil tasks for the townsfolk. And this is great! It puts all three of the girls outside their comfort zone and aids them in understanding why their sisters do the things that they do in the way that they do them. It ties into the argument they have at the beginning of the episode perfectly. I should also mention that right before they go, the three of them place a bet that whoever manages to complete their task and get back home the fastest is the one who gets to choose the movie for movie night. The films that each of them wager do a good job at reflecting each of the girls' personalities as well, and seeing how this episode is all about how the three of them differ from each other, I'm glad that the episode utilizes something like this to further emphasize that point. The films that are parodied are The Bridges of Madison County, Sharknado, and, well, I'm not sure if Bubbles' film is parodying anything or not. We begin by following Buttercup first, as she flies into Townsville while commenting on how she's not being weighed down by Bubbles anymore, which should make this go a whole lot easier for her. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's fine. Then we get this. This'll be easy without Bubbles cuting up the joint. Especially when I have Ruth Bader Punchberg and Amelia Punchheart. Yeah, honestly, after making us witness her arms flexing, she totally deserved that. To make matters worse, this won't be the last time we see it either. She refers to each of her arms as Ruth Bader Punchberg and Amelia Punchheart, so needless to say, this reboot's recognizable creativity is shining through here. 
I get the significance of specifically choosing famous females in history, but at least make better puns like Ruth Bader Hitzberg and Amelia Armhart. Yeah, so they don't use the word punch specifically, but it still gets a similar point across and sounds better too. Simply replacing one word with another word that sounds nothing alike is scraping the bottom of the barrel and shows minimal effort, if you ask me. So after getting her face smashed by a car, Buttercup ends up landing in front of this giant dog monster and chucking a car right back at him, sort of as a way to give him a taste of his own medicine, and then the two proceed to duke it out with each other. As one can guess, there's no contact, plenty of censoring by hit flashes, same old, same old. This dog monster exhibits a similar power that the Amoeba Boys were seen to have in the original series with the episode Divide and Conquer, where they have the ability to duplicate themselves, only difference is the dog multiplies whenever he gets hit. As a result, Buttercup quickly realizes after hitting them a bunch that punching is not going to be the solution to her problem, and she's going to need to figure something else out. But before we continue on with her, it's time to check in with Bubbles, who is happily floating by and looking up at the clouds. And that cloud looks like a bunny. And that cloud looks like a house. And that cloud looks like a peach. I see what you did there. Her personal challenge revolves around the classic logic problem about the goose, fox, and bag of seeds. Basically, for those not in the know, the farmer needs Bubbles to help him get three things across the river, but she can only take so much at a time on the boat that's provided for her. She's restricted by the fact that the goose can't stay with the seed or it will eat it all, and it can't stay with the fox or it will bitch slap it across the face. Which, I mean, isn't in the original seeing as it's the other way around with the fox eating the goose, but same principle applies. The simple solution to the problem is to take the goose over first, then go back for the fox and bring that over, while taking the goose back again, then taking the bag of seeds over, and then finally going back for the goose and bringing that over. I like how both Buttercup and Bubbles' problems are disguised as things that they think they'll be able to accomplish with ease because it's something that they associate with, but there's a secret underlying twist that makes it more difficult than it appears at face value, with Buttercup's punches being useless despite fighting a giant monster and Bubbles having to think carefully despite working with animals. The same also holds true with Blossom, which is where we're headed next as we see her arrive inside this library where a giant brain robot is consuming all of the books inside while accumulating knowledge at a breakneck pace. Obviously the robot is making a ruckus as he just piles through text after text while making an obscene amount of noise and as we all know being loud in a library is never a good thing as the librarian clearly points out to Blossom when assessing the situation. But no worries there, this monster fight is taking place in a library so this will be a piece of cake for Blossom, right? So she attempts to come up with a plan in order to defeat this robot, and let's see what she comes up with. If I push that rack of books off the computer, it'll flip the screen, letting me use my laser eyes to reflect the light onto the rope, which holds the famous Townsville Library chandelier in place! Okay, so, you know, that's great and all, but here's the thing. How does pushing a rack of books into a computer tilt the screen when there's a desk in the way? As we can clearly see here, the cart is going to stop when it hits the desk, so unless she's relying on inertia to carry the books off the cart and into the computer, that's probably not going to work. Not to mention that she also runs the risk of the book not tilting the screen at enough or too much of an angle that if she were to fire her laser eyes at it, she might end up missing the rope entirely. She's probably just better off throwing a book at the screen rather than relying on this cart, and even then there's also the possibility of damaging the computer which could either break the screen completely, rendering it useless, or forcing her to replace it with her own money after the fact if the librarian is really that much of a jerk. Regardless, let's just say that this much of the plan is successful so far. Now she's expecting her laser eyes to bounce off of the screen and hit the rope, but why can't she just hit the rope with her laser eyes directly? That would easily eliminate the middleman by getting rid of the rack of books and computer screen problems entirely, making this plan of hers so much simpler by removing plenty of excess variables that are too much of a risk for the reward. And even then, there's nothing stopping her from just shooting the robot with her eye beams directly. It's not established that this wouldn't work, and Blossom makes no observations of that, so why not just hit it with her zappy eyes? I get that Blossom's whole character flaw here is that she relies too much on plans, but her plans in and of themselves are flawed. All that really needed to be added to fix the problem was by throwing a barrier in the way of where she was floating so that she'd only be able to get to it with the angled computer screen and boom, 
problem solved. If she weren't able to go straight for the rope directly and would have to fly over to it, it would give the robot ample enough time to counteract that. Always remember, small details make a big difference. Before she can even finish talking about her plan out loud to herself, the robot throws the same chandelier she was going to hit him with at her, exclaiming that thanks to reading all of the books, he can now predict her every move just like the alien could from the episode Forced Kin in the original. Wow, that's two parallels from the original in this episode. Huh. Every plan she can come up with is now null and void, and to further add to her problems, he threatens to make her become part of the Dewey Decimal System. Because kids today totally still know what that is, right? Prepare to become part of the Dewey Decimal System. <laughs> So we're back to Buttercup, who's slowly being backed into a corner because she's at a loss as to what to do. In her own words, she's tried punching, kicking, punching harder, and kicking harder. Not sure why she hasn't at least tried her Green Lantern powers or laser eyes, for instance, but hey, it's not like I expected her to. This isn't the intelligence challenge, that's Bubbles' problem. She does, however, observe that the dog monsters obey her commands just as any regular dog would, and she quickly uses this to her advantage in order to calm them down and get them to listen to her in one of the most out-of-character moments I think I've ever seen for Buttercup in almost the entire series. Dog. Hmm. Speak. Ooh. And I mean, it is hinting at the moral of the episode in the sense that Buttercup is now seeing why Bubbles thought the lobster monster's tail was cute earlier, but even still, this feels like a bit much of a stretch to get the point across. Yeah, she realizes she was wrong when she openly mocked Bubbles cuting up the joint earlier, but the voice, eyes, music, and background just overdo it a little too much for my liking. Now, as for Bubbles, this is where things get interesting. Just as soon as she thinks she has the solution of taking the goose over first, the farmer points out that the goose was the only thing keeping the group of angry tourists away. Yep, the episode's headed in that direction. I think that of all three segments, Bubbles' is probably my favorite just because it's the most interesting of them all. The best moments in the episode all take place during her segment compared to Buttercups and Blossoms, which are just monster fights at their core. It's actually really weird of me to like the non-monster battle parts of the episode more than the monster battles. So, because she doesn't really want to have to rethink the entire problem all over again, she decides to go through with a different strategy. I just have to solve this the old Bubbles way. Come on, everybody, let's go! Follow me across the river, la 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 la! This is Bob and we are cute, la 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 la! Great job, everybody! Mission Bubbles accomplished! Hey! What are you doing? Not gonna lie, that moment was cute despite it completely failing on her, although the show seriously needs to stop with these non-puns. In what universe is Bubbles accomplished a pun on accomplished? The two prefixes sound nothing alike, it doesn't work. And returning to Blossom once again, we see she's still having trouble attempting to take this robot down because he outsmarts her every move. Yeah, there's not much more to say here, she just attempts to talk to the robot and then sneak attack him by throwing a book at his eye, which I don't know how that would do anything, but it doesn't matter because he just sends a pile of books tumbling down on top of her anyways, followed by pummeling her with a seemingly never-ending stream of punch cards. Now if only the show would include punch lines. Yeah, in all fairness, Blossom's segment is my least favorite of the three simply because the other two are far more interesting and, well, because of something else coming up. So now the episode goes back to revisiting Buttercup to see how she ultimately discovers the solution to her problem, and let me tell you, it isn't pretty. Lay down! Roll over! <laughs> Bobs would love this! Play dead! She probably wouldn't have liked that. It's pretty gruesome when you think about it. And Buttercup has a point, that probably would have traumatized Bubbles for life, let's be honest here. And now things are about to get a little more complicated, because we go back to Bubbles for one final time to see how she manages to solve this mess of a problem. Okay, so I can't leave the goose alone with the fox. And I can't leave the farmer alone with the tourists. And I can't leave the tourists alone with the robber baron. <laughs> but the robber baron can't stay with the starting lineup of the Townsville girls basketball team. And none of them can go with Sherlock Holmes and the Raptor King. 
So now we have to worry about the girls basketball team, Sherlock Holmes, the Raptor King, and not Dick Dastardly. I mean not Waluigi. I mean not Bowler Hat Guy. I mean not Robbie Rotten. <laughs> Got all that? If not, then that's perfectly okay, because Bubbles can only take two things over at a time, and even if we are to assume all the tourists count as one person, I'm fairly certain this problem actually has no solution, considering you're essentially forced to take the Goose, tourists, and basketball team over first. Of course, I have been wrong before, so maybe I'm just not seeing the solution. I can at least tell you outright that Bubbles' first step is wrong, because when she takes the farmer and the Goose over first, she leaves the robber baron with the basketball team and the tourists with the fox. But before Bubbles even begins to solve the problem, she has this gag where she thinks about what her mentor would say, with Buttercup appearing in her thought bubble to say she's not her mentor, and that somehow gives her the solution to the problem. Don't bother asking me how that works, but she magically gets everything across the river anyways, and just like Buttercup ends up killing something in the process. And finally, the robber baron! No, 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 no! Ah! And finally, after all of this, we get to see Blossom's finale. Now, some of you may remember my April Fool's video from 2017 titled Blossom's Inner Demons, and if you do, then you already know where this is headed. Blossom does the same what would my mentor say joke that Bubbles did, and visualizes herself stating that she should keep following through with her plans. Honestly, it's no surprise to me that she thinks of herself as her own mentor. Then in waltzes Buttercup, who tells her to stop thinking, as does Bubbles, who spins around and hits her in the face for some reason while saying the same thing. What would my mentor say? I say plan more, plan often. Dude, stop thinking! But I can't! Oh, hey Bubbles. Stop thinking! Seriously, I'm not sure what was with that spin move thing. Also, as a minor detail that I noticed, Buttercup and Bubbles actually end up exploding outside of the dream bubble despite being a part of her imagination. And this is what ultimately leads Blossom to have her colossal meltdown. I mean, it's only fitting that Blossom figures it out the Buttercup way when Buttercup did it the Bubbles way and Bubbles did it the Blossom way. It makes a perfect loop. You know, I've seen this scene so many times at this point, and I still can't fathom everything I'm looking at. Like, this is not a face I ever wanted or needed to see in Powerpuff Girls. It's just too much. And while I do admit that it gives the whole setup with the kid telling her to shush some shock value, it isn't exactly fitting. Oh my god, what's wrong with your face? A similar comparison can be made to the episode I referenced earlier, Forced Kin, in the way that Blossom manages to defeat the robot monster because it's awfully similar to what Mojo did in that episode. Both feature a villain who's able to predict every plan they try to use on it, so the solution is to not have a plan at all and go all ape shit on them instead. Kinda easy to draw that parallel there between the two, but I feel that this version of it doesn't really work as well because Blossom snaps just like that. There isn't a long buildup of frustration that ultimately gets Blossom to this extreme of a point. She claims that all of these plans happened off screen, which is unfortunate because now we just have to assume she failed a bunch of times instead of actually seeing her do so. Had we seen her plans fail more than twice, I think the sudden outburst would be a bit more justified. But enough about that, the three girls all arrive home at the exact same time and exclaim to each other about their newfound appreciation for their respective perspectives. And the episode ends on a high note with the girls arguing over what movie to watch once again, only this time they're arguing in favor of their sister's movies instead of their own. Oh, and there's one final line from the farmer. Wait a minute. My farm is on that side of the river. And for once, this is actually true. If you paid close attention to the shot where Bubbles first flies to the farm, you can actually see the silo in the background, indicating that it is indeed on the left side of the river. Plus, the farmer never directly states that he needs to take all of that stuff to his farm, so there's no continuity mistakes presented here either. Bravo for paying attention to the smaller details for once, show. You did good. So right off the bat, I'll happily say that this was the best of the first four episodes of season two, 
hands down. All three of the girls had an equal amount of time in the spotlight and were given their own unique scenarios that while at first appeared to be fitting for them, quickly revealed themselves to be more fitting for their sisters to solve. I like the way the episode pulls a bait and switch on all three of the girls. It could have easily just had the girls arrive on the scene and immediately realize that it was something outside of their comfort zone, but Splitsville decided to be a bit more clever than that, and it makes it all the better in that regard. It's a great instance of the characters' strengths being turned into weaknesses when they realize they can't save the day the way they typically want to, because their usual methods are getting them nowhere. Like I stated before, Bubbles' moments were my favorite of the three, although I don't want to denounce Buttercup's moments too much because they were perfectly fine in their own right. It's just Blossom segments that I had a little bit of issues with. This was quite the pleasant surprise considering what I had initially thought Splitsville was going to be about, as I hinted at towards the beginning of my video. Overall, I can safely say Splitsville is definitely worthy of being called a good episode, although it still has its flaws. Hopefully some might be willing to check it out if they're curious, but it isn't something I'd consider required. Thank you all for watching, and till next time, Shadow Streak, signing off.